Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, In Vitrogen Eyebright Analysis Software, An Introduction and Overview of Key Analysis Workflows. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Janaki Narahari, Staff Scientist, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Dr. Narahari, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you to all our audience today uh, for your interest in our eyebrite uh, analysis software. We'll bring, uh, begin with a brief overview of the eyebrite imaging systems, and then I'll have a demonstration of the accompanying analysis software. We'll conclude the session with some uh, Q&A. Okay, we offer a series of instruments starting from the entry-level eyebright CL750 imager that is capable of uh, imaging chemiplots and gels to the high-end instrument that is capable of uh, imaging up to four fluorescent channels to suit all lab needs. All of the official scientific eyebright instrument, uh, instruments can image up to four uh, blots or gels at a time, and they all contain a 9.1 megapixel cool CCD camera which is capable of uh, capturing high resolution images. Our images allow onboard image analysis to individually analyze up to four blots in an image. As I've mentioned in my previous slide, all our images, uh, Im imagers are capable of imaging multiple samples at a time. So we only found it fit to allow even image analysis to have that kind of flexibility. So we do provide analysis software on board as well as standalone, which is able to individually analyze all the four samples that has been imaged together, here, but they can be analyzed separately, individually. So on the instrument, we have basic analysis uh, capabilities, which allows you to do densitometric analysis, molecular weight estimation, as well as normalization. For extensive analysis, we offer standalone eyebrow image analysis software. The images and the analysis performed on the instrument can be directly exported to the cloud for continuation of analysis, or they can be exported to the network drive and then imported into the desktop analysis, uh, desktop analysis software. You can also export your analysis and the images to the USB stick and import it into the desktop via a different route. I will be demonstrating all these three shortly. All the three, uh, methods of export and re-import, they allow for a seamless transition of analysis between our instrument and the analysis software. The eyebright image analysis software is uh, available in multiple formats to provide maximum flexibility. The desktop version is available for free download on Mac as well as PC. The eyebright analysis software provides a complete solution providing tools for image adjustment, analysis, annotation, report creation, and other features. These features cannot be comprehensively covered in one hour. Therefore, I will go over the basic utility and the location of features and tools in today's seminar. We will have other presentations to go over at a different time to go through in-depth analysis workflows that are available in the hybrid analysis software. So now we will move to the uh, software demonstration. So once you launch the hybrid analysis software, you land in the gallery page. So as I mentioned, the gallery is the landing page for the eyebrow analysis software. And it contains the management tools, the file management tools. 
As I previously mentioned, if you had exported the files directly from the image to the cloud, this is the page where all the image files will land. If you had exported them to the network drive, which was previously set up for the iBread Analysis app, then they can be easily synced using the sync icon. However, if you had exported them to the thumb drive or to a location elsewhere, they can be imported into the analysis app using the import images uh, tool under the actions menu. The images are uh, by default sorted actually by date. And the, later, the most recent images are located right at the top of the image gallery. Doing so allows the user to easily access the most recent files. However, there are other options to sort the gallery. So if a user is interested in looking at images that were captured in a certain mode, they can sort the gallery using the mode. So here, as you can see, the images that were captured under a particular mode are grouped together. Or as we had previously seen when I launched my app, if, uh, if you want to use, see only your recently used images, you can sort the gallery using the recently used view. In this case, all the uh, files that you had worked on in the previous one week are grouped together. So for further processing, the image files need to be first added to the tray. So the way that you can select and add the images to the tray is by single click on the file. So a single click adds the file to the tray and another click on the same uh, file actually will remove it from the tray. So a single click adds to the tray, another click, it will remove the image from the tray. The other uh, if you want to look at the file name before you can select a file, hovering over the file, over the thumbnail, will now show you the name of the file at the top and also add the file to the preview window. In the preview window, you can access all the image information associated with the file. So I'm going to select a, a few files to take them through our workflow. Okay, once you have selected all the images and added to the tray, you can move to the next tab using, as I've mentioned, either the next uh, button at the bottom or the tabs at the top. For today's presentation, I'll move to the next step using the tabs above. So this page is where all the tools required for image adjustment are located. So the tools in the zoom control and the image options, they are applied to all the channels if you have a multi-channel image in the viewport. I'm going to change the image and select the chemi image because I would like to demonstrate the uh, crop feature. So as I've mentioned, the crop feature here is going to be applied on both the channels, the chemi and the membrane. So at this point, I want to um, just give a little bit background about our image display itself before moving to the crop. So by default, in the iBright image analysis software, the display is always composite image, which means that it is an overlay created with all the channels in an image. So for chemi channels, when you are imaging on the iBright imager, it captures a membrane image as well as a chemi image. So what you're seeing here is an overlay of the chemi channel and the membrane channel together. The way to tell them separately is, uh, or the way that you can identify how many channels are being displayed in the viewport is to look at this area, the view and edit channels. Here you can see all the channels that have been listed and the eyeballs over here will uh, tell you which channels are being displayed. And if you do not see a black eyeball, uh, I will being shown, that means that that particular channel is not in display. So currently what I'm showing you is that I have turned the chemi channel off. So the same way you can just turn the display of the channel back on by clicking on the eyeball. So right now, as I mentioned, in the image display, it's a composite image. It contains two channels, the chemi and the membrane channel. So I'm going to walk you through the image options. 
So this is the tool that uh, crop is the tool that you can use to remove the unwanted area uh, from your image. For example, in this particular image that I'm showing, we have two plots that have been imaged. However, neither one of them are really straight. So to get good analysis on the image, you do have to straighten this particular plot. However, we cannot achieve a perfect straight line since both the blots are not aligned. So what I'm going to do is to crop each of those uh, blots individually and then process them as two independent samples. So to crop an image, you select the crop icon. It will uh, show you an area. You can uh, move the area around. You can enlarge and shrink. The, the, cover, the, the area that is covered by this particular a template that is being shown here is the area that is going to be saved after your crop cropping. All the areas surrounding this particular template here will be removed from your file. So once you're happy with the area that you want to crop, click Save. Doing so will create a new file. And this is done to prevent modification of the original file. The new file that is created retains the original file name, uh, but it appends it with the word crop. This way you can always trace it back to the original file from which this particular new file was created. Now, as you can see, you can see the slant in, in the blot, and you can straighten that using the straighten, uh, straighten tool. You can turn the image by one degree increments either to the, uh, to the left or to the right. In this case, it's pretty obvious that we'll have to turn it towards the left. So I think this gives pretty straight line. So once you're done straightening the image, click on the straighten tool again to make it uh, to save your rotation. And if you are not happy with the uh, rotation that you see, since it, you know, uh, the black background doesn't look uniform, you can perform another crop event on that. So in this case, I want to remove all the black area surrounding so that I don't see the angle of rotation there. So save. So this is a feature that helps you to Clean, clear up your image from an image that wasn't properly imaged to start with. However, I do want to uh, emphasize the fact that it is much better to image the blots correctly to begin with. Eyebright instrument does have the auto rotation feature, which if you use one sample at a time, will straighten the sample for you, and therefore you may not have to straighten the image in the analysis software at all. The other tools in this image options are rotate. This will rotate the sample by 90 degrees, uh, by a step of 90 degrees, and flip. You can either flip horizontal or vertical. And invert. When you apply invert, it just inverts all the channels at the same time. So as you had seen before, the uh, image that you had seen showed the black signal on the white background and inverting it has inverted the signal, and now you see the white signal on the black background. However, it's always better to see the signal as black on white since it's easier to differentiate it over the background, so I'm going to invert it back. So these are the tools that we have applied on all the channels, right? I mean, crop, as you saw, crop, rotation, all of them have, uh, have been applied on the image as such. So all the channels were taken as one, and then it was uh, all the um, options were applied on, you know, all the modifications were applied on all the channels together. However, there are some other tools that you can apply at, uh, on a single channel, such as false color. Why do we need to use the false color? Again, this is the best example that I'm showing over here, right? You're looking at both the chemi and the signal from the membrane. It's really difficult for you to differentiate what signal is coming from which channel. So one way to do that, as I've shown you, is to deselect the uh, channel that you're not interested in. However, to you know, estimate molecular weight, it's much better to have to see the markers right on that. So I like to always keep the marker channel on when I'm in the chemi mode. So the other way to differentiate it would be to apply false color to the signal from one or the other channel. 
since to begin with, the markers are uh, were pre-stained markers. I'd rather apply the false color to the membrane channel. So I'll I'll show you how to do that. We can go down to the false color accordion, and as you can see right now, there's no false color applied to either of the channels. And to work with only a single channel, you have to select the channel for editing, right? And that is shown by this pencil mark. Right now, it's the chemi channel that is selected. So if I apply false color, it will be added to the chemi channel. So I'm going to select the marker channel, membrane channel, and then I'll go to membrane here and then add the false color. So now you can see that the markers have been uh, labeled as blue. So they have, uh, false, the blue false color has been applied on the signal in the membrane channel. Now it's very easy to distinguish between the signal coming from the membrane versus that coming from uh, the chemi channel. So what we have gone over here is how to select um, the channels for image display versus editing. We have seen how to crop and rotate the images. The zoom controls, I don't think uh, there are any difficulty. You, you can just zoom in or zoom out based on uh, how you want to look at your image and how to apply false color. Now, the other part of image adjustment is also to adjust the image display as such, right? To make the uh, signal look darker or lighter. And that can be done through the image display enhancement section over here. So I'm going to go back and select the chemi channel because that is what we are mostly interested in. I'm going to turn off the membrane channel just so that you can see the differences in the image uh, in the contrast adjustments. So to make to make the signal look darker, right? You, you can play around with the black and white to the level that you want to see. You know something that was barely visible before, you can now start seeing it come over the background, right? And if you're not in, uh, happy with that, you can always click auto contrast again, and it is going to reset the image to the previous auto contrast levels that were shown by default. And if you don't want the, uh, that either, you want to look at your raw image, you can click on the auto contrast again, and now you can see the full stretch. So this would be the raw image. However, the, uh, for good, uh, good image display, you can either go for auto contrast or do manual adjustments to the level that you wish. And this again, the histogram changes are applied to a single channel at a time. So if you want you, uh, to modify the look of your membrane channel as well, you'll have to select that for editing. Once you select the channel for editing, it is automatically um, toggled on for display as well, because you can't edit the channel without visually looking at it. So here you can adjust the membrane channel as well. I'm going to make it a little bit lighter. Maybe. There we go. So those are the basic image adjustment tools that are available over here. So the other tool that uh, one needs to pay attention to is show saturation. So when you before you move to the analysis tab or when you are performing analysis, it is essential for you to look at the pixel saturation. Uh, as you know that once the pixel is saturated, it can no longer retain uh, or accumulate any more signal. And therefore, the analysis performed on saturated pixel or near saturated pixel is not accurate. So to make sure that your data is worthy of analysis, you can turn on the show saturation. And as you can see that in the chemi uh, layer, there is no saturation seen in this uh, or in any of those bands. So this image is pretty good for us to perform analysis on. And that is what we'll go next. Okay, so this is the analysis tab. So as soon as you move from adjust or from gallery directly into the analysis, the analysis software automatically performs a, an analysis for you, and it displays the identified lanes and bands. If you are unhappy with the analysis that is performed, you can go and delete the frame. So to delete the frame, I'm going to turn off the saturation over here because 
the membrane channel is showing too much of saturation, so you cannot see the frame uh, being selected. So there you go. And now you can select the frame. It is already selected. The first frame is always selected by default. Um, and you can tell that by the magenta color. So if you're not happy with the analysis that is being shown, just go to the frames and select the delete icon, which is uh, you know all uh, right over here. Or uh, you can cancel that. And then you can also use the keyboard delete function. Right? And in the PC, it is directly delete. Whereas if you have a Mac, you have to do function and delete to perform the same action. And then you can apply. At this point, you have two options. Either you can draw your own frame to perform a reanalysis, or go under actions and auto-analyze it again. But we came for auto-analysis to begin with, and we were not happy. So uh, I will not go and uh, perform the auto-analysis again. There's also a third option. You can go to the manual and you can select the region types and then identify the areas that you want to analyze. You know, you can draw the boxes. You can copy the box and paste it. So this is the region analysis, right? And you can resize and then you can move. But before you move, you have to deselect the region and then you can move it. But for today's demonstration, we are not going to be spending much time uh, on manual analysis. So I'm going to cancel it and exit it out and come back to the automatic analysis. And I'm going to define my own frame. I'm going to get it as close as possible. So yeah, you do have to use the minimum uh, frame size. You know, just clicking it once will not add a frame. And here I'm going to delete that because that's not the correct frame that I wanted to draw. So just hold the um, mouse down and drag it on the area that you want to add the frame. And then apply if you're satisfied. And then you can see the analysis has been performed. As you can see, the lighter bands are still not detected. So I can go to the lanes and bands and add the bands by selecting add band option. Or the other way to add a band would be to copy a band, but before you copy a band, deselect that icon and paste it, and you can move it to the new location, right? But to add a single band, uh, one at a time when so many, if you want to capture all the signal over here is really tedious. So instead of doing that, you can actually select multiple bands at a time by just dragging, holding the shift down and dragging uh, over all those uh, bands and then copying them and pasting. And then you can now move them to the new location as you want. Or you can, the other way to uh, select multiple bands is holding the shift and clicking on the bands one band at a time. That works both ways. Similarly, you can resize the bands, you know, either one band at a time by using those handles to resize, right, or move. All these functions can be performed on one object at a time or multiple objects. I'm saying objects because the same can be applied to the lanes as well. If the lane, if you need to skew a lane, go to skew lanes and then you can move, skew the lane if the lane wasn't identified correctly initially. And then once you're done with all your adjustments, remember to apply because the data is updated only upon uh, you know, uh, committing your changes. So that is the basic lane and band adjustments that you can perform in iBright analysis software. And they're all located up front over here. Now I'll just show you where our analysis workflows, workflows are located. So you can go to the analysis here and click on that and select the workflows from the drop-down menu. Clicking on the markers will allow you to perform molecular weight analysis. Selecting quantitate will allow you to perform relative or absolute quantitation. You can select one or the other. 
or you can select normalize and then you can perform either normalization using a housekeeping protein or total lane uh, protein-based normalization. For today's seminar, we are going to concentrate on just the marker workflow. There will be other seminars going in depth over each of these workflows at a later time point. So once you select the markers, you have to go and select the lane which contains your marker standards. However, as I mentioned, right, we are in the chemi channel that was selected for editing. So you do not see the bands selected uh, from the membrane channel. So you, you have to change the channel for editing so that now you can see the, uh, the true signal coming from the membrane channel. If you want to go ahead, we did not spend time on um, uh, getting rid of the non-specific bands on the membrane channel or making sure that all the bands were identified. Actually, if you see here, there will be uh, other very faint bands, you know, the high molecular weight bands that did not get transferred. So you can either go back to the frames and add the missing bands, or there's another way to handle it, which I'm going to show you. So come back to the markers, right? and select the lane in which you have the protein standards, and then choose a marker. By default, we have around 10 molecular weight marker standards already preloaded in our analysis app. If these are not the standards that you have used, you can go to add or edit custom markers and create your own custom marker and save it. And for today, as I've said, we are going to be using one of uh, the preloaded markers. Okay, I have to select this lane, right? And then go. We have used the eyebright molecular weight ladder, so we know that, so we're going to select that. However, since I have said that this band was not selected, I know that these do not align correctly, so I have to drop the 250 molecular weight marker because that band was not identified. The way I would do that is by going to the tool area and you know, deselecting it. So I'm telling the software to ignore the 250 marker because that doesn't exist in our image. Similarly, if you see all this lower band, this is where the sample buffer was running and therefore any analysis in this area will not be accurate. So I'm going to drop the, the last band as well. So now that uh, you're satisfied, with what you see here over here, I think even that is on. There we go. You can apply and say that, okay, now perform my molecular weight analysis using the standards that are shown. You can go to the graph to look at your molecular weight uh, regression analysis. So by default, we show point to point regression analysis. However, you can change it to either linear or linear semilog, and most often linear semilog works better. But I'm not going to change that for today's demonstration. What I'm going to show you is how to look at your data from the chemi uh, channel in this particular view, right? So you can go up here, and this is where you can select the channel that you're interested in and go and select a lane. And what you'll see is all the bands that are within that lane are now represented in, on the standard curve. So this is how you can tell the molecular weight of your bands. So if you're happy with your data, uh, you can uh, say done and exit the workflow and go to your main analysis tab, or you can go to the data table. So in this particular view, you do see the data table and also the image on the side. It makes it easier for you to compare between the image that you're seeing and the data that is associated with it. In this, uh, you can add more columns uh, to the data table by choosing this hamburger menu. If you had performed a particular analysis, then the column is automatically added. For example, if you had performed rolling ball background correction, that would have already been added. By default, we always perform the local background correction, so that is already there. We also, by default, show you the density. If you do not want, you can just toggle this off and remove it from the view. It just hides the columns. The data is always available. And I want to look at the band purity, right? I mean, you can always toggle that on if you, if you want to look at that, right? So this is where 
you know, all the, uh, the tools are located for, you know, what you want to see in the data table or what you want to hide. I'm going to close that. And if I'm, want, uh, if I'm interested in just seeing the data for this band, right, so I can click on that. What it does is it highlights the band in the viewport as well as it brings the data associated with that right to the top of the data table, making it really easy to align the band with the data. The reverse can also be done. I can select a band data in the data table, and now the uh, band will be highlighted. So now again, it's easy for me to associate and see you know, the, the band to which this data belongs. There's another option as well. As you can see, there's so many bands over here, right? And when I'm exporting data or when I'm creating a report, I may not want information for all these bands. So I can go and select this filter option. What it does is it creates an empty table and lets you start adding the data that you wish to see. So for example, I'm only interested in these bands. So I can just go and select those bands, right? And then it'll just give me, filter the data for those bands. So that's another option that we have in the data table. So once you are happy, you have uh, looked at the data, you're satisfied, you can exit the data table using the close. You know, just close it, and then you will land back in the workflow that you start. And then you can exit and go to the main um, analyze data tab by clicking on the frames. So that was the basic analysis that can be performed in the iBread analysis software. I wanted to take uh, a fluorescent image because there are a few other options that are available for fluorescent images. So here, as you can see, right, I mean, it's a multi-channel image. It's a four-channel image, three fluorescent channels in one membrane. So this image looks pretty neat, right? I mean, there's hardly any background that you can see. That is because of the option that we call as auto enhance. What auto enhance does is that it will remove the non-specific uh, background from the uh, image, leading to a nice and crisp, clean image in the image display. I do want to emphasize that none of this image display enhancements that are applied, whether it is auto contrast, auto enhance, show saturation, or false color, none of these affect the raw data. So your analysis is always performed on the raw data. So there's no data manipulation. Uh, your analysis is not hindered by making these changes. So if you wanted to see the true background of your image, just click the auto enhance off, and you can see how much background is coming from the different channels. You can you can toggle off the auto contrast as well, right? Oops. Right, to see your full stretch, and that depends upon you know which channel you have uh, you're looking at. But basically, that is how you can look at individual channels. The other thing that I forgot to mention actually is you, when you're in uh, performing analysis it is always better, especially when you're in the fluorescent channel, because it's really difficult to see this very faint band. It is easier to go to the grayscale, right? And here, in your viewport, you're only shown a single channel, and you're shown as black on white. So it's much easier for you if you adjust over here. It's much easier to see the signal, you know, in those bands. And if you had applied these kind of adjustments to the color mode, right? your image may not look good, right? So the, that is why we don't actually perform such drastic image adjustments when you're in the color mode. So I'll go and no, I'll just do auto contrast, and then I'll apply auto enhance. So the image looks good. And like I said, if you want to look at uh, the signals a little better, go to the grayscale and you can just keep moving between the channels. You will be seeing one channel at a time. And since there is higher, <coughs> excuse me, this higher background in the fluorescent channels, another tool that you can use to make sure that you are getting good band coverage is view lane profile. So 
Once you launch the lane profile, select a lane, and what it uh, does is it will show you the lane profile on your right. And it also shows you the band location, right? the peaks for each of those bands, and the band coverage. So once you select the band, you can see the red area that you can see over here. You can see that there are, there's some area that is not covered by the band that is shown over here. To work easily, you can just go zoom in and you can adjust the band over here, right? And it should update in real time in your uh, graph. And you can this way make sure that you're capturing all the signal that belongs to the band. And here you can increase it a little bit, right? Okay, so now you can see that it is pretty good coverage. And once you're done adjusting all the bands that way, you can apply. In this particular uh, mode, right, in, within the lane profile, you cannot adjust uh, more than one band at a time. You have to work with a single band. And in this tool, uh, in this area, if you notice, you do have other options, you know, to perform rolling ball background correction. And those, again, will be covered at a later date. So for today's presentation, um, this is what we wanted to show through the lane profile that you can adjust band coverage very well if you use the lane profile uh, option. You can close the lane profile over here and then move back to uh, the analysis, the main analysis. Okay. So I think that that is basically what uh, we wanted to show as a part of demonstration today for the analysis. So next step, I have analyzed my image, right? And uh, we have adjusted, we are happy with the adjustment. So the next step would be to annotate the image. So again, I'm going to select an image that I've previously annotated because there's a lot of annotations that can be applied. And I'll just show you how to use the tools in this. So again, if, if the image was analyzed and you want to label the lanes or the frame or the channel name, it is, the, it is easiest to do that using the data table. So you can go and click in the lane that you want to add the uh, label. And then, so for me, the first lane would be molecular weight marker. So I'll just add that. And then you can save it. And once you add the label over here, it is now displayed uh, in the viewport. Similarly, I can add a label for the frame. If this is a single frame, so it does it may not matter that much, but as I mentioned, that we do a lot of multi-frame analysis, right? So it is always good to label frames as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to label it with, uh, with the cells that I used in that experiment. And when you add that, you can see that the frame labels appear at the bottom of the frame. You can hide the labels using this eyeball, the same the same feature as uh, show or hide the channel, right? Um, click on the eyeball, hide it, the uh, annotation goes away, and click it once again, and now you can see the annotation come back on. So you can individually control what annotations you want to show in the viewport, right, once you label it. You can label the channel name, the uh, channel, as well as the bands, individual bands, right? I mean, I can expand this and label the band as well. However, those annotations do not appear in the viewport, but they will be exported when you export uh, the data as an Excel. It is more important to have that for documentation purposes rather than you know overloading the uh, image in the viewport with a lot of annotations. So we do allow you to uh, annotate the bands as well as the channels, however, they will be exported with the data and not shown in the viewport. The other way to annotate the image, if you wanted to just, uh, you know, give a title to the image, or you know, as I've shown over here, just add some text annotations. Um, you can go click on the text and click in the viewport where you want to add the text and 
add the text over there. So in this case, I will just say, you know, text. You can change. So in this case, it is magenta, right? Magenta color is selected by default. Whereas I can, you can also select the color that you want. So in this case, I want to change it to blue. I can change it, right? And then you can do the same with the, you know, shape annotations. I can add a tool. I can add an arrow. I can draw a box if I wanted to highlight this, for example, right? I can add a box around it. The thing to remember if you're going to highlight is not to use a fill color because then that is going to cover your text. Right. Otherwise, if I wanted to create a white box over here, then I can just draw a box and I'll, I can use the white color to fill it. Right. So that is how you can use some of the shape and the text annotations over here. So uh, another thing again to remember over here, I think I, I did not mention, I should have mentioned it at the beginning of the annotation, is to make sure that you are adding annotations to the correct channel. We are viewing the uh, composite image again. However, the text annotations that I just added, I added it to channel 800 because that is what was selected for editing. However, maybe that is not my intention, right? Because AKT is not in the 800 channel. It is in the Super Signal West Jira, right? So if I now go to that particular channel, See, I have the AKT, but I don't have the box that I added around it. So it is very important for uh, us to remember that when you are in the composite mode, the modifications that you're doing, right, that apply to the individual channels will be added to the channel that is selected for editing. So in this case, what I would suggest is if you want to add annotations to a specific channel, go to the grayscale, right? Go to that particular channel and add the annotations there. The annotations that are added in this channel will appear in the composite image automatically. It ensures that you are putting the annotations at the correct place. And since the lane and the frame is common to all the channels, you will see the lane and the frame annotations coming through all the channels. So this is safe to do in the composite image. But when you're labeling the specific signal that belongs to only one channel, go to that particular channel and add the annotations there. And then when you come back to the composite image, you will see all the channels together. So that is what we have in a nutshell for our annotations tab. So what we have demonstrated today is how to take an image from the gallery, adjust the image, perform some basic analysis, and annotate. And one thing that I forgot to mention when we were in the gallery, so when we go back to, uh, let me go back to the gallery and let me show you that, is when I mentioned the file management, you can delete the images, right? But to delete the images, you have to select the images and add them to the tray. And then go to Actions menu and hit Delete. And when you hit Delete, it is going to remove all the images in the tray. So please make sure that you are truly only having the images that you are intending on deleting, OK? And the other options, the common features that are present across all the workflows. And there will be analysis report, image, and uh, image export. So for analysis report, right? You, so analysis report is usually uh, will be created for the image that is selected. So we want to create an analysis. Let me go back to annotate since you know that is where we were working. And yeah, before I forget, another thing that I wanted to let you guys know: if the image was not annotated, uh, was not analyzed when you came to the annotate table, and then you feel that you it would have been easier if we had performed analysis, you will have an option here to auto-analyze it. You won't have to go back to the other tabs to perform analysis. You'll be able to perform analysis and annotate it from the same place. OK, so now to show you how to generate an analysis report. So under the Actions menu, Click on Analysis Report, and it will show you all the options that are available. 
you can either generate uh, the PDF. So the analysis report is always exported as a PDF. So the page orientation, you can select either portrait or landscape. If you select portrait, and if you had too many columns, data columns, then it's going to wrap around and you, you're going to have a bigger report. So based on the number of columns that you have, select either portrait or landscape, whether you want to include the images and do you want to include the layers on the images? Do you want to show the analysis objects or not? You can show or hide those features over here. You can include the data table and also the chart. The chart here is you know, the chart that I showed you when we were performing molecular weight analysis. Or if you had performed absolute quantitation, there is a regression chart that goes with absolute quantitation as well. So that is the chart that you can either include or exclude. So in this particular case, I can include the chart as well. I'm selecting the portrait for my page orientation. I'm including everything that I can get and then hit preview. Right. You can scroll down and see how your report looks. Obviously, we did add a few annotations that sh shouldn't have been there, but that's okay. Right, and if you're satisfied with what you're looking at, um, I'll, that's the chart and these are the tables, right? We didn't have that many da uh, data columns, so it fit in really well uh, in the report. If you're happy with what you see, you can you know, select the download icon and you can download and save the file. I do want to open a few more columns just so that I can tell you how, uh, I can show you how it looks. If you haven't performed those there, it will not add that anyway, so the columns will be empty. Let's see if we can see those. Now we can see many more columns in the report. And the same thing if you had um, generated the report as portrait, then you would have seen the columns wrapping around. So th that is a good feature to have, just based on the amount of data that you have, select the page orientation. And now for image export. So there are two ways that you can uh, export image files. One by right clicking in your uh, viewport. It allows you to just export one file at a time. And in this, this is the place where you can select whether you want to export it for publication or for analysis. Analysis always exports the raw data. So none of the modifications that you had done, image enhancements or uh, you know uh, previous analysis annotations, none of those are retained if you select analysis. In the publication, you have option to select between three file types. And you can also select uh, the resolution that you would want to apply on your image to export. And you, you can as well, you can also uh, define the size of the image that you would like to export it as. The aspect ratio for the image is always fixed because we don't want the image to be distorted. So you're, uh, you can either input the height or the width and the second dimension is automatically calculated. And as I mentioned, it also you also have the option to include annotations or ex exclude annotations. So based on your selections made over here, the image that is exported will either contain the uh, lanes, frames, and bands, or annotations or not. The other feature that we have right over here is file rename. So this is the place where you can rename your file during export. So for example, if I wanted to export this file to share with a colleague, right? So I can say share with, or if I wanted to say this is a image for a publication, right? So I can put that, or right now I'll just say you know, complete. Uh, so right. 
and I can export uh, based on whatever file name that I want. One thing to remember is that if you rename your file during export, it is the new file name is only applied to the exported file. The image that is in the gallery will not be renamed. So if you want to rename a file uh, in your gallery, you can do so. I'll show you how to do that as well. So basically, rename here. It'll, if you were doing batch export, it'll tell you the total you know, file size of your exported file so you can understand you know, well, how much space it's going to be occupying, whether you can put it in a thumb drive or not uh, for, during your export. You can browse for the location where you want to uh, save the file. And then you can, uh, once you select the location, then your export will get activated and you will be able to export it. And for if you want to export it for analysis, you have the option of exporting either as TIFF or G2I. If you select TIFF, all your if it's a multi-channel image, your channels will be exported separately, each channel as a TIFF file, and you can take those TIFF files and analyze them in a third-party software if you wish to do so. But if you want to share it with a colleague to be reanalyzed or used in the IBET analysis software, export it as a, as a G2I because this is the only file format. This and the WIT file are the only two file, file, file formats that are um, imported into our IBET analysis software. None of the other file types are compatible with the IBET analysis software. Okay, so that's basically the options that we have for image export. And let me just quickly go and show you how to rename files. So to rename file, um, files in the gallery, you just click over there, select that, and then you can put a new name, give it a new name, and that name will be saved. So that is how you can rename files in the um, IBET analysis software. So I hope you learned something today, um, and uh, you, you will be willing to give our hybrid analysis software a try. So good luck with that. Thank you all for listening. I'll turn it over to Jennifer now. Thank you, Dr. Narahari, for your informative presentation. Before we start our Q&A session, we received a few notes in the chat that the image report was not displaying on the screen as uh, Dr. Narahari presented. We were experiencing some technical issues but can share an example image report if needed after the webinar to anyone that is interested. Please follow up by email if you are interested. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, how many frames can I analyze with multi-frame analysis? Okay, thank you for your question. So um, what I uh, understand the question is about is, you know, in an image, how many independent frames can be analyzed? So I had, uh, as I mentioned in my seminar, um, on the instrument, you can image four mini blocks or four gels. And therefore, on the instrument, all the four can be now in independently analyzed. When you come to the analysis software, though, uh, we remove the restriction of uh, only analyzing up to four independent blocks or images. Here in the analysis software, uh, we have successfully uh, analyzed up to eight to 12 independent frames. So yeah, you can uh, image up to four mini blocks or mini gels, and you can create additional frames, and you can analyze multiple frames independently, independent of each other. Thank you, Dr. Narahari. Our next question, can iBright analysis software be used to support FDA Regulation 21 CFR Part 11 compliance? Yes. Uh, our instrument, iBright, uh, iBright Imager, as well as the analysis software, do provide 21 CFR Part 11 support. Um, on the instrument, if you're already, uh, if you have already purchased an instrument and a current user, you can um, purchase just the support uh, part of the 21 CFR Part 11 licensing support. Um, 
for the analysis software, we do have a specific installer, a separate installer for the analysis software that can be downloaded. And once you have purchased the license, you can uh, go ahead and install the software and uh, use it for 21 CFR Part 11 support. But however, I do want to uh, make it clear that just using our instrument and the analysis software doesn't provide you complete uh, compliance, compliance to achieve total compliance, you do have to follow your institute's uh, policies, uh, procedural policies, as well as uh, the technical support provided by our instrument and the analysis software. Thank you again, Dr. Narahari. And we have another question. Can Western blots be used to quantitate protein amounts using iBright analysis software? Yes. So uh, as I understand this question, um, the user would like to estimate uh, the amount of an unknown protein. Uh, it can be done through our analysis software. Um, the option is located under analysis and we call it absolute quantitation where the user can go and create a standard graph. However, the experiment needs to be set up uh, appropriately uh, for that function, right? I mean the user should have a purified protein uh, diluted at different, con uh, you know, loaded at different concentrations so that they can now have a good standard curve. And there's some adi additional um, experimental conditions that you should uh, keep in mind. Uh, all the data should be within the linear range and such. So if you are interested, please reach out to our technical support and they'll uh, put uh, you in touch with us. Uh, if you need guidance on the experimental conditions, uh, you can reach out to the technical service and we'll be more than happy to support you on that. Thank you, Dr. Narahari. We have one final question. I noticed, I noticed during the analysis portion of the presentation that the iBright protein ladder selected in lane one for molecular weight analysis didn't have the two distinct chemi signal bands that I'm used to seeing. In addition to the pre-stained marker bands, can you comment on that? Sure. Just give me one second. Let me check on what you're saying. Uh, maybe I selected the wrong lane uh, to designate as my protein standard. And yes, thank you very much for your question. I did select lane one, which is actually not the iBright protein standard. Uh, I should have selected lane two that contains the iBright uh, protein ladder. So uh, thank you for catching that mistake and uh, making us aware of it. Um, so yes, if you look at lane two, you will see the two chemi uh, bands, the standard, uh, the, the control bands that are there in the iBright protein ladder. Um, so yes, a good catch there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Narahari. Do you have any final comments for our audience today? Thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed giving this presentation, and I hope you uh, gained some knowledge uh, on uh, how to use iBright analysis software. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our technical support uh, in case you have any further questions. Thank you again, Dr. Narahari, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Stay tuned for our second webinar coming on April 29th, which will cover more in-depth workflows, including quantitation and normalization. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.